All right. We'll call to order the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology for hearing on H.R. 3670, the Anti-Spoofing Act of 2013, um, the LPTV and Translator Act of 2014, and the E-Label Act. Um, we're here today to conduct an important part of the committee's uh, business, a legislative hearing on bills and discussion drafts. We'll be considering three different but useful pieces of legislation that will benefit consumers, streamline electronic device manufacturing for the digital age, and protect Americans from misleading communications. H.R. 3670, the Anti-Spoofing Act of 2013, aims to prevent bad actors from using spoofing services to misrepresent who is sending a text message. Introduced by Representatives Barton and Mang, uh, this bipartisan bill enhances the protections of the Truth in Caller ID Act of 2009 by extending the prohibition to text messaging. Spoofing, when a caller purposefully falsifies who's originating a call or a text message, has often been used maliciously by scammers to trick unsuspecting recipients. By utilizing one of the many easily found spoofing services, the perpetrator can make a text message appear as though it's from anyone the sender chooses to impersonate, usually posing as a familiar website, service, or friend or relative of the recipient. Thinking they're talking to someone they know and trust, the person on the receiving end is convinced to give up personal and sensitive information like bank account numbers or passwords. For example, customers of a Florida credit union received text messages that, they're, that were allegedly from the bank, alerting them to unusual activity on their account and requesting information including credit card numbers, PIN numbers, and account numbers. While the credit uh, union was able to quickly detect the scam and alert customers, there were thousands at risk for compromised personal information. This bill intends to protect cell phone users from this kind of harmful mischief in the same way we protect consumers from spoofing or voice uh, caller ID. Uh, next, we'll consider uh, the LPTV and Translator Act of 2014, a discussion draft offered by Mr. Barton that uh, 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 addresses how the FCC should treat low-power television stations and television translators in the upcoming uh, broadcast incentive auction. The incentive auction was one of this committee's contributions to the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 and offered broadcasters compensation for relinquished spectrum to be used for other purposes. While low power stations and translators are not eligible to participate in the auction, this draft urges the FCC to account for the value of LPTV and translators to communities all across our country. Translators play an important role for so many in the Mountain West, including my own district in Eastern Oregon. I have long urged the Commission to keep this value in mind when conducting the repacking analysis and was happy to work with Mr. Barton on the language on this discussion draft. This draft would memorialize that sentiment in law as well as allow LPTV and translator licensees additional opportunities to petition the FCC to stay on the air after the incentive auction process is complete. Finally, we'll consider uh, the E-Label Act, this bipartisan, bicameral proposal is a common sense piece of legislation that brings outdated regulations in line with consumer expectations. Currently, all equipment and devices that are licensed by the FCC for radio frequency compliance must have a physical label, a physical label that shows the licensing information. You'll see it right there on the back of your smartphone. The e-label act would allow manufacturers of devices with screens like smartphones to display a digital label rather than the physical mark on the device itself. Now that makes it easier and less expensive to put a label on your ever-shrinking electronics. This legislation is another example of bringing existing regulations in line with modern technology. By allowing digital labeling, consumers and regulators can still access important information easily without the sometimes onerous requirements on manufacturers. Reminds me of those labels on your mattress that says, do not remove this label. Under penalty of Under law. Under penalty of law. E-labels can provide more detailed information. Did you ever cut them off, by the way? E-labels can provide more detailed information without the space limitations of a physical label, as well as potential cost savings, as labels can become part of the code programmed into a device rather than etched into the external body of the equipment. I want to recognize the FCC for their work on this issue, led by Commissioners O'Reilly and Wo Rosenworcel. The Commission issued guidance for manufacturers wishing to use digital labeling for their devices, including guidelines for how to properly display the information and how to educate consumers on accessing the labels. I also commend my colleagues, Representatives Latta and Welch, as well as Senators Fisher and Rockefeller, for their bipartisan work in this effort to streamline and modernize consumer protection rules. More efficient government and regulation for the innovation era is a goal of the Energy and Commerce Committee and one that our subcommittee is clearly committed 
to furthering. Look forward to the testimony of our witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. And now I recognize the gentlelady from California, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Eshoo, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you stopped, I thought, is he going to recognize me? And you did. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome to our, uh, our colleague, uh, Congresswoman uh, Meng uh, from New York. We're delighted that you're here and, uh, and proud of uh, the work product that, uh, that you have uh, brought forward. Um, 3670, the Anti-Spoofing Act of 2013, is a bipartisan bill, and it's aimed at uh, reducing the number of fraudulent phone calls and text messages received by millions of Ameri uh, Americans. Um, it's a very practical bill. It's a bill that uh, is really going to correct something that I think everyone in the country wants corrected. So I really salute you for coming up with something that is um, very practical. Just this morning, uh, NPR ran a story about a series of uh, spoofing incidents uh, in Maryland where people received calls uh, purported to be from the state police demanding payment for court or traffic fines. Uh, you know, I mean, most people would just out of a little bit of fear and intimidation just pay yeah. attention to it, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, these uh, frauds would uh, uh, do very well by, uh, 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 by their fraudulency with uh, vulnerable people. So at a time in which uh, unscrupulous behavior is on the rise, um, this pro-consumer bill will better protect Americans from becoming victims of scammers and deceitful uh, telemarketers. And uh, again, I commend uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Meng for her uh, leadership and for assembling a bipartisan group of co-sponsors. Um, that's, the, that's the secret sauce around here, and I uh, salute you for doing that. Uh, uh, coupled with the endorsements from uh, AARP, the Major County Sheriff's Association, the Major Cities, Chiefs Association and Public Knowledge, which is uh, uh, wonderful that Public Knowledge has uh, 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 endorsed the uh, bill as well. And uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to uh, uh, your calling for uh, proceeding with a markup of this bill because it's an excellent one. I'm also pleased to support uh, uh, our colleague uh, Mr. Latta's bill, the E-Label Act. That, too, is a bipartisan bill. Um, and uh, he worked with uh, our colleagues, Mr. Welch and Ms. Blackburn, in introducing that earlier this week. You explained what the e-labeling e guidance issued by the uh, FCC earlier this month does. And, um, and to promote the electronic labeling for FCC certified devices, the phones, computers, smart watches, um, this is only going to grow, this field. And uh, uh, this needs an update, and I think it's an excellent one. Uh, I have concerns with the LPTV and Translator Preservation Act. Uh, low power television stations provide a very important public service um, in communities around the country, particularly in uh, rural America. And it's why, as part of the Spectrum and Public Safety Act of 2012, members agreed on a bipartisan basis uh, to preserve the spectrum usage rights of LPTV stations, but giving the FCC new instructions when they're well into the design and development of the most complex spectrum auction ever conducted, uh, I think would add unnecessary complexity, and it could dismantle, I'm not saying will, but could dismantle the carefully crafted balance on other issues of importance uh, uh, to the subcommittee. Uh, including maximizing both licensed and unlicensed. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the testimony of those that are here today, uh, the distinguished first panel and the second one, and I yield the remainder of my time to uh, Mr. Doyle. I want to thank my friend for yielding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for this hearing today, and, and uh, we look forward to hearing from our colleagues. Mr. Chairman, I want to use the short amount of time I have to just uh, – make some comments on the proposed Communication Act update. Uh, this is something that uh, I've been monitoring with great interest, but also some concern. Uh, I know at this point that majority staff has released a number of brief white papers on spectrum, competition, and interconnection. I think these are important issues, and it's this subcommittee's duty and responsibility to address these topics. Uh, but I would say to my friend that, that these updates won't move forward 
uh, and unless you start reaching out to members and staff on our side of the aisle. These issues are real, uh, that are at stake, and there's real opportunities to make things better for the people of our country. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to use the opportunity to, uh, to urge you in the most friendly and kind way uh, that we move forward with the limited time in the session that we have over the next few months to engage our side uh, in, in meaningful discussion uh, so that we can put forward a bipartisan uh, discussion of these issues. Uh, I thank you and I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the gentleman's comment. We'd be happy to have that conversation with him at another time. Right. Now, uh, uh, all times have been expired, so on that side. Now we'll go to uh, recognize Mr. Barton for uh, five minutes. I don't think I'll take five minutes, Mr. Chairman, but I do appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. There are two bills that I've been actively engaged with that, that are uh, the subject of this markup today. Uh, H.R. 3670, which is the Anti-Spoofing Act of 2014, and um, the Low Power TV and Translator Preservation Act of 2014. Representative uh, Ming, who's uh, uh, sitting at the witness table, and I have been working closely on H.R. 3670 to modernize the Truth in Caller ID Act back in uh, two of 2009 to include text messaging services, IP-enabled voice services, and to hold foreign spoofing services accountable to the law. Due to the many conversations that we've had with various stakeholders, it would be my intention if this bill does go to markup to offer an amendment the nature of a substitute to address some of the concerns that have come up in the stakeholder discussion. There have been a number of spoofing incidents <coughs> this year alone, one in, one in Abilene, Texas, in my state, just last Friday, when a person pretended to work for a roofing company in order to collect money up front from the customers that they were calling. Another incident uh, uh, just uh, two weeks ago involved the Bank of America, and someone commented on the story that they received text messages from what appeared to be the Bank of America directing them to call a number uh, concerning a problem with an account, with their own account, only to later realize that it was a scam. Uh, the majority of the members of this subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, uh, including yourself and Ms. Eshoo, uh, have co-sponsored co H.R. 3670. So this is a bill that I think, uh, to echo what Mr. Doyle just commented on, does have bipartisan cooperation, could move through the committee to the floor and even through the other body and to the desk of the President this year. On the Low Power Television <coughs> and Translator Preservation Act, it's, it, I'm, I'm very, um, quite frankly, surprised uh, on both sides of that one. Uh, some of the strongest low power TV advocates are against this bill because they think it doesn't do anything. On the other side of the equation, there are people that think it goes too far and that somehow it would... Uh, impact in a negative way the pending uh, auction. The truth of the matter is that with your help, Mr. Chairman, I think we've got it just right. Um, it does give low power TV uh, license holders uh, increased moral standing, if nothing else, uh, in their petitions uh, before the uh, FCC. But as you know and I know, uh, under current law, they don't have a guarantee they have a secondary license which can be revoked by the FCC. If this bill does become law, they will still have a secondary license. They, are, they will not have any guarantee, but they will have <coughs> the strength that, the, again, if this were to become law, that legislatively the House and the Senate, as signed by the President, wants the FCC to work with low-power TV license holders to give them the best chance possible uh, to maintain their viability in the marketplace. Uh, on the low power TV, Mr. Chairman Bill, I've worked with the National Association of Broadcasters, the Advanced Television Broadcast Alliance, the National Translators Association, the National Religious Broadcasters. I've also worked very extensively with you and your staff to modify and to uh, hopefully perfect this bill. So I do hope, Mr. Chairman, we can have a, a, a good hearing, <clears throat> and I hope in the very near future we can go to markup on both of these bills. Thank the gentleman who now yields to the uh, vice chair of the committee, Mr. Latter. Well, thank you very much uh, for the gentleman for yielding, and thank you very <coughs> much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this legislative hearing on these important bills today. 
With the advancement of technology, businesses and consumers alike have reaped tremendous benefits to ensure that consumers continue to profit from groundbreaking applications and services and businesses continue to find opportunities for investment and growth. We need to make sure our laws reflect the 21st century information and communications technology marketplace. This will not only help foster future innovation as the E-Label Act promotes, but it also protects gains we've made with technologies currently employed today, which the Anti-Spoofing Act and the LPTV and Translator Act address. I look forward to addressing and engaging in a closer examination on each of these bills, and I thank the Chairman. I yield back. Chairman yields back the balance of his time, and I think now we go to um, who on your side would like to would recognize uh, for Mr. Waxman's time. Welch, Mr. Welch, Welch do you seek any time? Mr. Doyle, any further time? I don't. Let's, Ms. Anshu? let's get to our witnesses. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Good move. I like the way you think. <laughs> um, I think we're okay on our side, right? Because we've done both. So at this point now we'll go, well, look who showed up at the witness table. <laughs> it's a twofer, a lot of twofer. Um, we're delighted to have both of our colleagues here today and appreciate the good work that uh, you have both done on these and other pieces of legislation. And so with that, we'll go to panel one, and uh, we'll recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, to open, and then we'll go to uh, Ms. Ming uh, as well. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to uh, give testimony on the legislation today. Also, I want to thank... Uh, uh, the ranking member Eshu and all the other members of the subcommittee today. I appreciate the opportunity to present testimony on the bipartisan e-label act. The Federal Communications Commission has instituted an equipment authorization program where e electronic devices are required to display a physical label documenting that it has been properly certified by the Commission for Commercial Use. The label is also intended to provide consumers with means to readily obtain additional information about the device as efficiently as possible. While the information contained on the label serves as an important function and extends meaningful benefits and protections to consumers, the time has come for the Commission to update its rules to reflect modern technology and modify its equipment identification requirements to permit, to permit electronic labeling or e-labeling for wireless devices. The current rule requiring physical labeling was adopted by the FCC back in the 1970s. The Commission re revisited that rule in the late 1980s, and while it eliminated some labeling requirements, the technological uh, cap capability of wireless devices at the time was admittedly not able to fully support an equipment authorization standard or other than the existing physical labeling system. As we all know, technology, especially in the wireless market, has advanced significantly since that time, and wireless devices are today equipped with numerous functionalities. They are without question able to support the modernized equipment authorization standard of e-labeling if given the option. Permitting e-labeling would not only facilitate efforts to bring our communication laws in line with 21st century technologies, but it would also benefit both manufacturers and consumers. Manufacturers have increased flexibility to design innovative products that consumers demand. It would also reduce device manufacturer development costs. According to the Telecommunications Industry Association, e-labeling could result in over $80 million in savings per year for, for companies. Consumers in my state of Ohio and across the country would also benefit from the efficiencies created by e-labeling. E-labeling can expand consumer access to relevant device information and enhance the overall quality and availability of equipment identification records through supporting software. The FCC recently released guidance on e-labeling. I welcome the FCC's efforts on this issue and recognize it as an important first step in promoting the use of e-labels. The e-label act will facilitate efforts at the commission by establishing a time frame for moving forward with a rulemaking. This will ensure that the commission takes timely action on this issue and resolves any uncertainty that manufacturers might have in opting to use e-labels. We are in the midst of an innovation era where new and groundbreaking technologies and devices are introduced into the information and communications technology marketplace almost daily. Our laws need to reflect this reality. I thank Congressman Welsh, Congresswoman Blackburn, and Ranking Woman Eshoo for their support on this measure. 
I thank Chairman Walden again for the opportunity to present the testimony today on E-Label Act and advance efforts to modernize our communication laws for the digital age, and I thank the Chairman again. Thank the gentleman for his testimony, and now we'll go to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Meng, uh, for her testimony on this legislation. We appreciate your bringing this forward to us, and please go ahead. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for holding this hearing on my bill, H.R. 3670, the Anti-Spoofing Act, which I sponsored along with Mr. Barton, Mr. Lance, and seven other Republican and seven Democratic members of the subcommittee. I also thank you for inviting me to discuss the bill today. It is a great honor to appear before such an esteemed panel. We address today the problem of caller ID spoofing which is the scrambling of caller identification numbers. It is a tool often used to defraud unwitting recipients of phone calls and text messages. It is often stated that the measure of a society is how it treats its most vulnerable. Almost every day I receive new reports of caller ID spoofing that harms the most vulnerable in our society. We have reports of widespread caller ID spoofing of new immigrants which is why USCIS recently issued a formal scam alert on caller ID spoofing. And we have reports of widespread targeting of seniors, which is why the AARP wrote a letter in support of this legislation. Veterans are primary targets as well. Caller ID spoofing is also fracturing the trust built between communities and local law enforcement because scammers are falsely using police department's phone numbers to trick residents, as we recently heard today. For this reason, the major cities' chiefs association and major county sheriff's association have endorsed this legislation. I even saw the Chicago Tribune reported on Monday that the families of the unaccompanied minors at the border are being targeted by caller ID spoofing. I mention this not to wade into the border security debate, but rather to underscore the point that if there is a vulnerable or weak population among us, it is likely they are being targeted by caller ID spoofing. Shortly after entering Congress, I pursued this issue because of complaints from a local civic organization and seniors in my district. But I quickly realized it is affecting Americans in all corners of our country, in all of our districts. This past tax season, a huge scam was revealed whereby caller ID spoofing was used to dupe tens of thousands of Americans nationwide into thinking they were being contacted by the IRS, which they were not. I've had very good conversations with many of you on the subcommittee about pervasive caller ID spoofing in your own districts, and I think the fact that this is plaguing so many of our communities is a big reason why we have so much bipartisan support here today. H.R. 3670 is an update to the Truth in Caller ID Act of 2009. That legislation first criminalized malicious caller ID spoofing. But since the passage of that law, scammers have used legal loopholes and new technologies to circumvent it. Thus, malicious caller ID spoofing is on the rapid rise again. So it's time to strengthen and tighten existing law and shut down the routes by which it is being circumvented and that's what our bill does. There are three main parts to H.R. 3670, and I'll review them briefly now. Number one, the bill broadens current law to prohibit caller ID spoofing from foreigners. This is crucial because U.S.-based companies now spoof calls to U.S. residents with intent to do harm, but originate such calls from outside of the United States. Two, the bill broadens current law to include new internet-based voice over IP services that enable callers to make outgoing only calls from computers and tablets to mobile and landline phones. This is a technology that was undeveloped in 2009 when the Truth in Caller ID Act was adopted and therefore unaccounted for in that law. But it has now grown and has contributed significantly to the caller ID spoofing problem. Three. Finally, our bill broadens current law to include text messaging. We all know this technology has developed, and we thus see text message caller ID spoofing with increasing regularity. I also just want to note that current law and H.R. 3670 only pertain to caller ID spoofing with intent to defraud or cause harm. 
Sometimes caller ID spoofing can be applied beneficially and benignly, and we've taken great care to exclude such cases from the legislation. In closing, I'd like to once again thank the committee for considering this legislation and for giving the time of day to a freshman who's not a member of the committee. This process has been a wonderful and inspiring experience for me. To take a problem I heard from my constituents and work through the legislative process in such a po positive and bipartisan way to fashion to try and solve that problem. I'd especially like to thank Mr. Barton and Mr. Lance for working with me to write this bill, Chairman Walden and Ranking mm -hmm. Member Eshoo Wait for all their guidance, leadership, and support, and all the subcommittee co-sponsors who were instrumental in bringing about consideration of this bill. I'd like to thank the witnesses who came to speak today, and of course the committee and personnel staffs who have done such terrific work here. I look forward to continuing to work with the committee on this issue and legislation. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Meng, thank you for bringing this to our attention and working with our committees and our staffs on both sides of the aisle to move good public policy forward. We appreciate what you've done. Uh, we want to thank you both for being here. Uh, we actually won't grill you. Uh, that's our, our normal procedure uh, to let members come and make their case and depart. So thank you for being here, and thanks for bringing this to us. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, the second panel. Uh, while you two uh, depart, uh, Mr. Lewis Libin, did I say that correctly? Thank you. Executive Vice President, Advanced Television Broadcast Alliance, and Mr. Harold Feld, Senior Vice President, Public Knowledge. Uh, we uh, welcome both of you gentlemen here to testify this morning and uh, just bring those microphones close to uncomfortably close. Uh, that's kind of how they work. And uh, push the button, and Mr. Libin, we'll start uh, with you. And thanks again for being here. Chairman Walden. Ranking Member Eshoo, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, my name is Louis Libin. I am the Executive Director of the Advanced Television Broadcasting Alliance, which is comprised of hundreds of low-power television, or LPTV, broadcasters and owners and operators of translators. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify regarding the impact of the planned broadcast incentive auctions on LTV, LPTV stations, translators, and boosters. In particular, I appreciate the efforts of Chairman Barton to develop the LPTV and Translator Preservation Act, which will require the FCC to consider the great benefits of LPTV and translator stations, rather than indiscriminately eliminating their licenses without any consideration of the value these stations provide to underserved communities. LPTV service was created to enhance diversity by allowing more unique voices to provide free over-the-air television service. LPTV stations address the needs of minorities, women, ethnic communities, the elderly, children, and other underserved populations. They also broadcast in rural areas where full power stations sometimes are not commercially viable. Translators extend the reach of broadcast stations into isolated areas. More than 5,000 LPTV stations and translators serve tens of millions of Americans. In many places, these stations are the only broadcast television service available, and they often provide communities their only access to the affiliates of major broadcast networks. Many translators were built and are operated by local communities to bring broadcast television to their citizens. A third or, of, or more of the LPTV and translator stations are now at risk of being shut down by the FCC as it conducts the incentive auction. As you know, the 2012 Congress authorized the FCC to conduct an incentive auction of broadcast spectrum. The 2012 Spectrum Act expressed a fundamental principle about spectrum use, that spectrum allocations should reflect market demand. Unfortunately, the FCC's auction plan does not reflect this core principle. The FCC gives no consideration at all to the value of the service provided by LPTV and translator stations. Because the FCC does not have to share proceeds of the auction with LPTV or translator stations, those stations are simply free spectrum in the eyes of the FCC. From the perspective of the auction itself, there is no cost to eliminating LPTV and translator service. Under the FCC's auction rules, the FCC could cancel hundreds or even thousands of LPTV and translator licenses 
even if doing so would not generate a single dollar in additional revenue for the auction. The FCC could eliminate LPTV and translator stations just for the sake of running the auction faster or with less precise calculations or for the sake of completing the auction in less than half the 10 years Congress authorized. And that is exactly what the FCC is doing. It has adopted rules that run the auction at breakneck speed with literally no consideration at all of the impact on citizens served by LPTV and translator services. This is not a market mechanism. It is a pointless, tragic destruction of value, jobs, diversity, localism, and rural service. The FCC could shut down thousands of LPTV and translator stations to give wireless carriers spectrum in rural areas that they do not need and likely will never use. The FCC's incentive auction order also treats low-power television stations as secondary even to unlicensed services. Congress did not authorize the FCC to elevate unlicensed services over licensed LPTV and translator services. While the economic costs of the FCC's approach will be borne most directly by the licensees, the public served by these critical facilities is the big loser. The TV stations that air local high school football games provide ethnic and foreign language programming, provide church services and weather alerts, and bring network programming into rural areas that are already underserved, will all be gone without any consideration of the value lost to millions of Americans and regardless of whether, market, whether the market actually demands additional wireless spectrum in those areas. While LPTV and translator operators and their audiences would like to see much more done, the LPTV and Translator Preservation Act is a step in the right direction. We are very thankful for the support Chairman Barton has given to Americans who rely on LPTV and translator service. Thank you m very much again for the opportunity to testify. Mr. Libin, thank you. you go ahead and turn off that microphone. We appreciate your being here. We appreciate the, uh, your, your testimony on this important matter. Mr. Feld, we welcome you uh, to uh, this discussion. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo. Thank you very much for inviting me to testify today. I want to start by voicing my strong support for both the Anti-Spoofing Act and the E-Label Act. These bills provide necessary updates to the Communications Act, and public knowledge supports their swift consideration and passage. But while I agree with the principles behind the LPTV and Translator Act, I strongly recommend against consideration of this bill. Consideration of this bill creates needless uncertainty and delay around the broadcast incentive auction. I say needless because the FCC is already committed to doing precisely what this bill tells it to do. As I have said many times over the last four years, and as you have heard from others, the broadcast incentive auction poses enormous challenges for the FCC. The difference in complexity between the incentive auction and the first spectrum auctions conducted by the FCC in 1994 is like the difference between the cell phones of 1994 and the smartphones of today. But instead of the gradual evolution over 20 years we had in phone technology, we are asking the FCC to jump from the auction equivalent of a brick phone to the auction equivalent of an iPhone. Adopting this bill will create new delay at a time when the auction framework finally appears to be coming together. After nearly two years of contentious debate involving some of the most renowned spectrum auction experts in the world, hundreds of engineers, and thousands of stakeholders, the FCC adopted a framework for the auction in May. While much work remains to be done, we have reached the point where the FCC can set a timeline for the remainder of the process, and stakeholders can have confidence the auction will take place. Importantly, the FCC can begin building the entirely new auction software and hardware needed to make all the many pieces of this auction work together in real time. But we can only move forward from here if all stakeholders have confidence that the framework adopted in May is a stable foundation on which to build. Which brings me back to the LPTV bill. Despite efforts to limit the bill's scope, questions will reverberate throughout all aspects of the auction. Imagine a row of wine glasses packed tightly together. Tap one, and the rest start to hum as the vibrations ripple out. So too, implementation of the LPTV Act would reverberate through the entire auction framework. For example, the FCC will need to consider whether the bill's command to avoid terminations of LPTV and TV translator license where possible impacts the auction de and repacking design, or whether reduction in projection revenue would be an adverse impact on the auction. These questions implicate the repacking as a whole, 
The band planned and nearly every other key element of the auction design everyone thought we already settled. Work on the new auction software and hardware will slow or stop entirely until these questions can be settled again. And what is the urgent need that justifies this new delay and uncertainty? At the moment, none. The FCC is already committed to doing precisely what the bill requires. As part of the framework adopted in May, the FCC explicitly recognized the importance of LBTV and TV translator services and committed to completing a further notice of proposed rulemaking to ameliorate the impacts of the auction. Given that the FCC appears to be on the right course, there seems no reason to introduce new potential devastating uncertainty and delay. To conclude, the importance of localism and diversity in broadcasting is a value that no one questions. Localism and diversity have been the fundamental foundation of our national broadcast policy since Congress passed the Federal Radio Act in 1927. LPTV and TV translator licensees are important parts of that ecosystem as the FCC continues to recognize. No one wants to eliminate licensees providing valuable services to their local communities. I may add that just last week before this bill was introduced, I and other members of Public Interest Spectrum Coalition were present uh, at a meeting with the FCC staff and we once again urge the FCC to consider means to allow LPTVs to transition smoothly, including voluntary reduction in power, precisely the mechanism that the bill recommends. There is broad support for continuing service of LPTVs and translators, consistent with the direction that Congress gave to the Commission in the Spectrum Act of 2012. Passing new legislation, even if it is only intended to reinforce what the FCC is already committing to do, will reintroduce new uncertainty and delay at precisely the wrong time. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Feld. Uh, you have far more confidence in the FCC than I do. <laughs> but then I understand why. Um, let's, uh, I want to ask a couple of questions. Does this really matters to the public, to consumers, in districts like mine and all across, not only in rural areas, but urban areas? And I've met with a lot of these folks who have LPTV and uh, low power. They, they serve minority populations in many cases with specialty programming. And my message here, and I think it's shared by Mr. Barton, is I don't want a runaway FCC that simply squishes them because they can and takes them out. I'm also not going to give them full power authority because they didn't have that to begin with. But I, I think you're over the top in terms of kind of this notion you're going to blow up the whole auction because you actually admit that the FCC is headed down this path anyway. I'm reinforcing that. I, uh, I, I was hoping to have a lot more faith in this FCC. But I'm seeing some really bad behavior from the top down where Republican commissioners are kept out of the loop, where there's a process failure. I didn't think this hearing is going to get into this, but I just think you're over the top, and I'm just going to tell you that. Um, in places like my district, these, these translators are really important. They really are. And I want to send a clear message without screwing up the auction that they need to be thoughtful about this, whether it's in a rural area or an urban area. There are a lot of people served. And you could have a, a band plan that squishes out just for the sake of getting more spectrum available uh, for the big companies that want to buy it. And, and I think we've got to be thoughtful about the public spectrum and how it's, how it's used and how it's allocated. Uh, Mr. Libin, a number of your colleagues in the LPTV community have also expressed opposition to this bill, I think for other reasons, um, and have suggested uh, they'd rather have no bill than this bill. Um, could you explain why some LPTV providers feel this way? I think that they're concerned that by, uh, by opening this door, it's going to, uh, to bring discussions on LPTV and the auction in, and take it in places back to the FCC where uh, it, it may not have the conclusions that they want. For example, th there, there is a, an NPRM, a, further, a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking on LPTV coming up, but that's really just a mechanism to talk about how essentially the, the FCC has plans to shut down these stations. It's surely not a mechanism to help LPTV. The, the LPTV industry, I have to tell you, is very different than the big broadcast industry. I actually, I come from NBC. I'm used to uh, coming in with big contingencies. The LPTV industry is an industry of typically mom and pop. They're, it's a small businesses. Not that they don't employ people. They all employ a lot of people. Right. We're talking about eliminating thousands. It's a lot of, it's still a lot of people. But this is the other, the, essentially, the, there may not be unity in the community, but it's becoming We're more We're aware more. of that. But, <laughs> but it is becoming more and more. I believe yeah. that the industry is tightening up. I mean, you can see 
just in the past few months, we now have uh, the NAB is our partner, and we have the National Translator Association, and we're working with the NRB. So I think we're really finding the commonality that we need, but it's a small industry. Okay. That's the only questions I have. I'll uh, now uh, yield back the balance of my time, recognize my friend from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both Mr. Libin and uh, Mr. Feld. Um, it, it seems to me, I think I probably have more uh, an, uh, an observation after listening to the testimony and, uh, and of course, reading the, uh, uh, you know, the staff memo that, <coughs> excuse me, that there, uh, that there are some issues to be dealt with here. And I, I think it's a question of how it's done. I think it's a question of how it's done and how we thread the needle. Um, uh, uh, we had a chance to chat before, as I came into the hearing room a little earlier this morning, and uh, uh, you were talking about rural areas and then said the Bay Area. The Bay Area doesn't have a lot of rural areas, um, uh, but it does have some, and I asked you uh, what you were referring to. The and, South uh, Bay. What you were referring to uh, is, uh, is not rural. Uh, it's a heavily populated area. It's the northern part of San Mateo County, the county that I live in, uh, just uh, outside of the city and county of San Francisco and uh, very close to San Francisco International Airport. And uh, there's, it, it is the, the largest Filipino-American community outside of the Philippines that uh, resides in that area. So there are issues here and communities of interest that we need to look after. We're, we're not looking to... Um, do something where, uh, uh, where there would be a loss of jobs um, uh, or, very importantly, uh, uh, the, uh, the communications that these uh, communities of interest rely on. I, I don't think you have a case for completely rewriting the whole thing, to tell you the truth. And, um, uh, but I do think that we need to work so that, um, so that the, what I just mentioned and uh, or outlined, as did the chairman, uh, uh, that we thread this needle so that those two elements are not disrupted. Um, I appreciate Mr. Feld's um, uh, 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 testimony. Um, I love it when people come here and feel strongly about things. I really do, even when I disagree with them. I mean, it, it's the place to do that. And uh, uh, so I, I thank you for for that. I, I too have the concern that uh, uh, you know we are what now almost two years into the planning uh, for um, uh, for the uh, for the auction uh, for the spectrum auction, and it's the first time in the history of our country, actually in the world, that this kind of uh, uh, auction is going to take place. So. Uh, we're not, uh, none of us want to throw sand in the gears. And I, I think that's what you're talking about. And the, the chairman has, um, he has his misgivings uh, about, uh, about the agency and its jurisdictions and how they do things. I have, I think, more confidence than he does. But be that as it may, I, uh, I, I don't want anyone squashed in this either because I think we need to uh, look after these um, uh, uh, these uh, uh, important uh, uh, communities in our in our country. So I think more than anything else that we've got some work to do to refine this. Um, I really don't have questions to ask you. I think the chairman already asked uh, you, Mr. Libin, uh, uh, what I was going to ask. And uh, Mr. Fell, thank you for uh, for being here and um, for what you have focused on. And uh, you always come here with a lot of passion, and I love that. I love it. Um, so uh, I think that we have some, uh, some work to do together on this to help resolve some of the issues uh, that the, uh, we not throw sand in the gears relative to the auction, but that we recognize that there are communities of interest that are really reliant um, on this. And, um, uh, and uh, I don't think, Mr. Libin, you're going to get everything you want, but you know what? No one does around here. So um, if we can resolve it the way I think we're both describing it, uh, uh, then we will have accomplished something. And, and I yield back. General Lee yields back the balance of her time. We turn now to uh, the former chairman of the committee, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Well, thank you. And uh, I appreciate the testimony of both of you gentlemen. Appreciate the comments of Ms. Eshoo and our, our chairman. Uh, I'm going to go back to the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, 
they're, they're probably some of the younger people don't get those stories anymore, but, but I'm of an age that, that, that I remember those when I was a child. And um, there were three bowls of porridge, and one bowl was way too hot. So one of the bears said, it's too hot. And another bowl was way too cold, and the second bear said, oh, it's too cold. But then the third bowl, the middle bear said, it's just right. Now, our bill that's, is three pages, three pages, really just two pages. I'm going to read the relevant portion because this is one of these things that average people and even members of Congress can actually understand, <laughs> you know? It's low-power television translator and television booster stations, A, in general, now this is for the people that, <clears throat> that says it's too cold, okay? Nothing in this subsection shall be construed to alter the spectrum usage rights of low power television stations, television translator stations, or television booster stations. Shall be construed to alter the spectrum usage rights. This bill doesn't give them any new rights, okay? Doesn't give them any new rights. Now, B, preservation. And here the key word is the third word. The commission shall, S-H-A-L, shall, S-H-A-L-L, <laughs> shall. <laughs> One, in general, consider the benefits of low-power television stations, television translator stations, and television booster stations to the communities of license of such stations. Consider the benefits. So it says the FCC has to consider the benefits. Two, where possible, avoid the termination of a low-power television station, television translator station, or television booster station, as long as such avoidance does not adversely impact the reverse auction under subsection A1 or the forward auction under subsection C1. And three, after the completion of the reassignments and reallocations under paragraph 1B, permit any low-power television station, television translator station, or television booster station to request to, op to, uh, here, request to operate at reduced power from a different transmitter location consistent with the commission's rules if such station would otherwise lose its license as a result of such reassignment or reallocation. So what this does, it says the FCC shall, if possible, preserve the, uh, uh, the termination of the low-power television station. So, so it, it does give increased standing, but that's all. FCC still can make the decision, and it cannot impact the reverse auction. You know, Section A guarantees that. So with all due respect to Mr. Field, I think this bill is just right. It really, it, it elevates low-power television standing before the FCC. They have to consider these things, but once they've considered them, you know, they can't let it adversely impact the auction, and they go forward. So, you know, this is one of those bills where it's, it's funny to see some people in the industry itself saying, oh, this thing doesn't do anything, doesn't go far enough. Well, you can't give a right that they don't have now. But on the other hand, to have Mr. Field and his folks, oh, it's going to hold up the auction. Oh, my God, you know. Well, what the hey? <coughs> it just says they have to consider these things. I, would you tell me, I'll be happy to yield. I, I think the, the last part's also really important. It says, if after all, everything's said and done after the auction, if there's another way for them to survive, they should have the right to apply for that. Different location, different power, yeah. different whatever. And I think that's yeah, a, just so, a survival lifeline. You know, every now and then Congress breaks out in common sense. This is a common sense bill. It really is. Now, my good friend Anna Eshoo, if she's really got concerns about this, let me know. We'll work with you. But these stations have real value. But under the current law, it's not considered. And instead of just letting the FCC do whatever the heck they want, this bill at least says, hey, you've got to consider these things. 
And I think that's fair. I think it's the right thing to do. And I think it will result in a better process. As Mr. Libin pointed out, you know, why should you give an unlicensed operator operating in the white space more authority than somebody who at least has a secondary license? This bill does that, and I hope we can pass it on a bipartisan basis. Thank you for the, dis the courtesy. Thanks for working with us, and we appreciate uh, your passion and your involvement in this issue. It's very important. Now I'll turn to uh, the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I could have sworn, Mr. Chairman, that Mr. Barton was going in another direction with that fairy tale. I thought it was going to be Little Red Riding Hood, and I was just waiting for whom the big bad wolf was going to be, so I feel somewhat let down. That's, that's I'm, we saving that, <laughs> I'm saving that for full committee. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think as, as we talk about these issues, which are important issues, it's also important to look back over the history of telecommunications, because not just the LPTV stations, but the UHF stations that have served a more limited audience in remote areas of the country often were in the vanguard of some of the innovation and technology in the industry. I happened to represent a UHF station in Dubuque, Iowa, which was in the vanguard of cable television because it was located on the bluffs of the Mississippi River. They had a hard time getting over the air signals from more conventional VHF stations. And through the work that was done there decades ago, the basic foundation for what we now know as cable television started to emerge in communities around the country. And since this spectrum is held in the public interest, I think it's important for us to keep that focus on those who have gone before and have led us down paths of innovation that provide the incredible array of services we now get over this spectrum. So I guess for the panel, um, my question for you both is, uh, in light of some of the comments that have been made here today, in light of how people are served across the country through these current LPTV stations, what are the biggest risks and the biggest rewards you see from moving forward with the legislation as it's currently drafted? Uh, well, uh, first, I'd, I'd just like to address one misconception that, that I've now heard a couple of times, which is with regard to the relationship between LPTVs and unlicensed. Uh, it's important to realize that what the Commission has done is tried to balance things. And in fact, what the Commission did was to sort of merge wireless microphones, which are another secondary uh, uh, wireless uh, um, service associated with broadcasting and regarded as critical with broadcasting, with the unlicensed and say these are smaller transmitters. They operate in a way that's consistent with each other. We'll have them share some space. <coughs> and then over here with the larger fixed transmitters, the LPTV and the, uh, uh, and the uh, translators, um, we will have a different question as to how we try to fit them in the interstices of the uh, repacking. So um, this is not, the FCC was very careful to not revisit its existing hierarchy. Um, but what it has done is what Congress has uh, directed it to do, which is balance many interests. Um, in that light, I think that there is a tremendous opportunity here um, for the LPTV service as part of this uh, transition to the through the incentive auction. It is true that the LPTV ser service has fallen on very hard times um, for a number of reasons, many of which are not related to the incentive auction but have to do with the digital transition. Uh, with the fact that they do not have must-carry rights on cable. Uh, I used to work with this community a lot uh, uh, some years ago when I was at Media Access Project. Uh, my hope has been, and we have expressed it at every opportunity in our filings at the FCC, um, is that this is an opportunity for the Commission to recognize and reward uh, those licensees that are providing local service, uh, contributing to diversity, um, satisfying the public interest, um, and upholding those traditions of, uh, um, of uh, trustees of the public airwaves uh, while simultaneously examining um, those bad actors in the field who are um, you know, speculators or who were not serious um, or who for reasons totally unrelated um, to the incentive auction have uh, uh, essentially gone dark but still hold permits in the hopes that someday um, they'll be able to, uh, to come back again. And I think that um, the advantage uh, and disadvantage of this process is it is really 
going to help separate the uh, the genuine service to local communities and hopefully you know shine a spotlight on those and reinvigorate those um, while also maximizing spectrum efficiency overall. Thank you so much. Uh, I have to try to come back to the, the, the question that you had, which I th and I think the question really was uh, who will be impacted, and and it's a great question, and and that. If I knew that answer, then I would right now be sitting in the, uh, at the FCC because I think they're the only ones who know. If you ask me how many, who would be hurt, which LPTV and TV translator stations, well, not just stations, but they could actually impact through a chain reaction for translators because that's how they work. Mm -hmm. So how many? So the answer is it's hundreds or thousands or thousands, and it really, it really turns out to be uh, an amazing, nobody really knows. That's, that's really the whole point. We're looking for transparency here. We're really trying to understand. We don't. If you ask me right now, do we want to slow down the auction? Do I want to stop it? Well, the answer is absolutely not. We want this to go forward. We think this is in the best interest of, uh, of America, but we want to do it right. We want to make sure that everything we're doing won't be held up. We're just, you know, I, I, I could use examples of health. I'm not going there, but we all know that we want to do it right. This is a major deal. We are two, two and a half years into a 10-year process. We're not rushed. Let's get it right. Let's get it really done right. If we look at who's going to be hurt, if you look at the ownership of LPTV and translator stations, it's somewhere close to 30% is, uh, is minority and women ownership. If you look at the, uh, if we call it, the other broadcasters and cable, uh, it's, I think it's less than 3%. Those are the people that are going to be hurt. It's the people who are sitting, whether they're sitting in, uh, in Oregon or sitting in Youngstown, Iowa, or, and, and this is the only way they receive it, or in Utah and wherever they are, there are so many of these stations and so many people who rely on this service that I think we just need to tread very lightly when we're considering moving ahead with the auction. We need to consider LPTV and TV translators. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll yield back. Thank uh, you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll now recognize Mr. Latta for five minutes. Well, th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and again, thanks for our witnesses for testifying for us today. And it's, it's you know, a very good uh, discussion we're having here because I know uh, the question that uh, the, the chairman brought asked, uh, you know, uh, why are some people against the bill? Uh, ranking uh, member Eshu was talking about that, you know, we're not always talking about rural areas, but, you know, it's areas that are impacted that have certain minority populations that could, that could be hit. Um, uh, my friend from Iowa, Mr. Braley, we asked, you know, on the question about who's going to be impacted. But, Ms. let me ask you this, because, again, I represent kind of a unique area. It goes from very, very rural to almost into, a, into parts of a city, a large city. And when you're looking at all these questions that have been asked so far by uh, members of the committee, the, I guess the question is, if we have the FC is not mindful of these LPTVs uh, and the translator stations throughout the spectrum auctions and shut them down. When you have rural consumers or as uh, uh, the ranking member mentioned in larger cities where you have uh, certain minorities that might be impacted with that, what are the options uh, do these uh, individuals are gonna have out there from the rural or to the city if this had happened that they wouldn't have these LPTVs? I, I think that's a great question. When we talk about diverse, diverse is uh, we, we're talking about uh, financial as well, and there aren't always options. There are many options that uh, that uh, all America or typical America can have when it comes to whether it's entertainment or news, or wondering if that there's a tornado warning is coming and how am I going to get that. Well, if they don't have this free over the air coming to them, and a lot of people, this is the way they do have it now, they're not going to know. They're not going to know what's happening in their community. They're not going to know what's happening nationwide, but especially local. They're not going to know. Aside from, I mentioned uh, high school football and all of that, but it really has to do with life and public safety. This is their lifeline for many, many people. And it's so interesting. I brought up the uh, Youngstown, Iowa before because there are uh, a number of uh, LPTVs over there as well. But going back to uh, when I, I was mentioning, uh, in uh, in the Bay Area, so and you brought up the opposition to LPTV. You know, it really is like a chess game because in the Bay Area, we were talking about uh, the language uh, that they were speaking from the Philippines was Tagolog. I think I pronounced that right. Was that correct? 
Tagalog. Tagalog. There's a language that they do. But there's also Vietnamese and Mandarin, and they're all intertwined in that area. And these LPTV and translator stations are put like chess pieces there. So it, you're correct. If somebody now says, wait a second, we might have to move our station, well, if you're now receiving, you have your population of Mandarin, then what are they going to do with this station over here? So you're absolutely correct that there could be. So this is, these are all very, very good issues, but I'm glad that we're discussing them because all of this is very important to uh, an underserved population. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman for his questions, and now we'll turn to the – okay. Um, now we'll turn to who's next on our side. Uh, let's see. I think Mr. Long is next. Mr. Long, do you have uh, questions for our witnesses or a statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and <coughs> thank you all for being here today. Uh, Mr. Libin, could you give me a specific example of maybe just one example of a low-power TV station which would go out of business? if the FCC makes changes to the incentive auction? That's also a great question. So there are, as we know now, there are thousands of LPTV stations and translator stations, and I could make assumptions, but since we haven't seen any of the results of the auction yet, so I'm not privy to what any of the results of the, sp it, the spectrum repacking study, this goes into this, this, all of this has to take the geography of the country, and then it goes down to the level of the specific area, and it has to now you have to do station coverage and decide, well, there are different scenarios. How much spectrum are we getting back? If we're getting back so that we can sell in the auction a certain amount, it affects this number of stations. So you, you're asking a, a very, very good question, and I myself would love to know the answers, as well as the LPTV and the TV translator operators and owners, as well as the, one, the manufacturers of the equipment, because in, within the past, I think, past month, just last week, one U.S. manufacturer of TV translator equipment has gone out of business because of all the uncertainty in this market. So would, would the gentleman yield, Mr. Yes. Long? Let me rephrase the question that he just asked you or, or, or give a generic answer. Wouldn't it be more likely that, that a low-power television station that had been operating in an area that had been rural but had now become more urban or suburban and was in a growth area where there was a high demand for wireless service. So it's, it's maybe, maybe like the congressman's district in Branson, Missouri, that if there were a low-power television station, that station might lose its license because of the demand for, for, for wireless carriage because the population had grown. Isn't that an example, possibly an example? That's absolutely a very good example. Another example that would hit home to the chairman, to chairman Barton would be if you look at, uh, for example, um, you, if you take Texas and you look at Dallas, you could actually follow the translators along the interstate because that's where the populations are. And if one of them are impacted, the whole chain goes down. So in that effect, we're talking about a very big effect to a lot of people. So I thank the gentleman. For thank you so much. Let me kind of follow up with all the moving parts and pieces, and I come from a 30-year background in the auction business, so I know a little bit about auctions. Uh, with all these moving parts and pieces that you're talking about, isn't that also going to affect how the bidders will look at what they need and what this auction will provide? I, th I think so. I, I mean, that's, uh, that question is a terrific question. It has to have an impact, but the impact is really minor. It's a minor impact because, again, just by name, low-power television are lower-power television. So they just need to be considered just as if there was some terrain in the way or something else. There's the impact of low-power television into the auction to be considered in all the repacking scenarios is an impact, but it's not a major, major impact. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Feld, from your testimony here today, uh, you obviously think that the FCC has done a great job so far with this incentive auction preparation. Do you think they've made any uh, mistakes and should have done anything differently or do anything differently regarding auction preparation? Well, I think that this has been a very challenging process for everybody where everybody learns as they go. Um, if we had known two years ago that this was where uh, we were going to end up, we could have gotten here a lot faster. Uh, but 
Uh, I do have to say that one of the, the problems which I want to uh, highlight is, as, as Mr. Lemon says, from his perspective, this is a minor impact. But again, all of these impacts, because these issues are so tightly wound with each other, um, all have impacts everywhere else in the auction structure, which requires everything to be recalibrated. So I think part of the delay and part of the issue here has been how do you get all of these complicated pieces to work together when we have no guide and sometimes conflicting goals um, that uh, the FCC has been instructed by uh, uh, Congress to balance? I also think that there is a concern about time. Uh, Mr. Libin has said, you know, we have 10 years to get this right. Um, we don't really have 10 years. Congress gave the FCC 10 years um, to make sure that uh, things could get done, but uh, an impetus to uh, pass the legislation was the spectrum uh, uh, shortage, which we've been concerned about, and the demand for wireless capacity continues to grow. Um, it was to fund deficit reduction, to fund FirstNet, um, and the longer uh, we delay the auction, uh, the longer these remain outstanding uh, items uh, on our uh, federal budget ledger. Uh, so I think that particularly here, where I do believe that the FCC has been overall doing a pretty good job of trying to thread this needle, uh, and where we have a process that is unfolding now, uh, then rather than have uh, Congress uh, drop another bill, tell everybody to go back to, uh, um, to go rethink, does this legislation change the progress that we've made so far, um, that we ought to keep going. Congress should continue to exercise oversight. Uh, and if the, if the further notice does not work out uh, the way that Congress believes is necessary, there will still be time to take corrective action. Okay, thank you. And I'm way over my time. And thank both of you once again. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Uh, Mr. Long, thank you for your questions. Uh, Ms. Eshoo and I decided we're just going to put you in charge of the auction. Uh, we'll get yeah. this thing done. Yeah. be a lot cheaper, faster, <laughs> easier. <laughs> 15 years might take 10, 20, 30, 40 years. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and <laughs> we'll raise more money, and we guarantee we'll have more fun. Mr. Matheson, I'm just going to touch base with you one more time. Okay. Then we'll go to uh, Ms. Elmers uh, for uh, final questions. If you Thank have you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Feld, I'll start off with you just in continuing the conversation um, here. Uh, from what I'm hearing, um, you seem to believe that the proposed LPTV legislation would delay the incentive auctions. Obviously, you've kind of made that clear. Um, and obviously, this is problematic. But what are the consequences if the FCC f fails to protect translators and LPTV stations? Well, part of this is I. I understand that there is some suspicion here, particularly uh, um, in the LPTV uh, community, but from where we've been sitting and what we've been urging um, has been for the FCC to actually uh, uh, take great care to protect these services. The FCC has continued to recognize their importance. Mm -hmm. um, we have continued to stress their importance. Um, you know, Public Knowledge is an organization that has supported um, localism and diversity uh, in uh, media for a very long time. Uh, I think we all recognize that um, if services in communities that communities rely on go dark, that that would be a grave disservice uh, to those communities and would be contrary to over 80 years of communications law and precedent. Um, for that reason, I think that um, where the FCC is continuing to take these things very seriously, um, where the struggle has been to try to figure out how to balance multiple interests, um, that Congress should continue to exercise its oversight, mm -hmm. be prepared to step in if necessary, but legislation is a very big step. And I'm contrary to what uh, uh, Chairman Walden uh, uh, may believe, I know the FCC takes the acts of Congress very seriously. Um, at least they spend a lot of time considering them. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, there is a bill that is proposed now, my concern is that um, it causes everybody to take their tokens, go back to go, and reopen a lot of issues that we uh, had thought were settled. Okay. Mr. Libin, um, I, I understand there's a 10-year window of time that, that, that has been mentioned already. Um, what do you see as the relevant timeline for the LPTV TV and translators in terms of your feelings of the impacts of the incentive auction? Is that, are you, is the 10-year or are you coming down to a, a shorter period of time now as well, considering all things? Right. So. Oh, first of all, our goal is, as I said before, is absolutely not to slow down the process at all. It's, it's an optimization process. We now know more. We also know a little bit 
that the FCC sort of needs this nudge on LPTV and uh, TV translators and boosters because they've been advocating a little bit maybe on the side of the wireless providers, and that's where we sort of had this whole issue where now LPTV might be tertiary to the wireless providers. So I think that's why this is so important, is to come back with sort of the reminder from Congress that this is the way you have to treat LPTV, and I don't think that it really slows the process down. I think that, in effect, if we open it up, there are a lot of experts out there, a lot more experts who now could come in and can say, and th th by the way, there are many tweaks that have to be done to the software th right now. And so this is just another one. Let's add it in there and let's see how far we can help keep the, uh, the deadline, which is, again, we're all shooting for much less right. than years. Uh, Mr. Fell, do you want to expand on that? I, I would just like to add that you know, um, our organization, Public Knowledge, other organizations in the Public Interest Spectrum Coalition, which um, include organizations that care a great deal about uh, diversity in media, uh, have consistently hoped that uh, this can be a win for everybody. And uh, one of the advantages of the ongoing FCC process is we continue to try to work with the, uh, uh, all of the communities who are involved um, to find solutions. Uh, as I say, we have proposed the solution that is actually proposed in this bill is voluntary reduction in power in order to save uh, licensees. We think that there are other um, ways in which we can cooperate rather than view this as a, uh, um, as a uh, fight. Um, and my hope is that, in fact, what we need is not a push um, for the FCC to go back to the beginning and force everybody to go through all of this again, but instead mm -hmm. a nudge for all of the parties to come together and find solutions that are going to maximize uh, the efficiency for everybody. Thank you. And thank you both. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you, gentlelady. I thank our witnesses for your testimony. If you have other comments we should be aware of, please submit them. And I'm sure we'll probably have some questions perhaps from the committee, so we'll keep the record open uh, for submission of that as uh, according to our rules. We thank you very much. And I thank everyone for being here and participating. And we stand adjourned.